and welcome to July's Book Nook. It is a hot summer day and we are cool inside. We're about to talk about love and I am joined today by the lovely Amna Kreshi, author of, and settle in for this one, we've got The Lady or the Lion, The Man or the Monster, When a Brown Girl Flees, My Big Fat Desi Wedding, and we're going to talk about today, If I Loved You Less. Welcome, Amna. So good to have you hey. back. Thank you so much for having me. I always love talking with you. So I'm really excited to be back here. And honestly, when I found out you had done a retelling of Emma, I was like, oh my gosh, this is my two favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I love, I love Emma. <laughs> and so if you haven't guessed already, we are going to be talking about Beautiful retelling of Jane Austen's Emma, putting the Gen Z in Regency. I think I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Jordan H. Bartlett, author of Contest of Queens, Queen's Catacombs, and the upcoming Queendom Come. So... First things first, Amna, can you please tell me a little bit about yourself and this novel? Yeah, so my name is Amna Krashi, as Jordan introduced me, um, and she also introduced my list of books. So my first two books were a YA fantasy romance duology. The third book, When a Brown Girl Please, was a young adult literary novel. And then now I have my adult debut, which is a romance novel. Um, when I'm not writing, I love going on like walks and spending time with family and baking and kind of doing a lot of the things that the main character Homera does in this book. Um, so that was really fun for me to write. I was kind of just pulling little tidbits from my own life for the story. Incredible. And of the six Austin masterpieces, you chose to write a retelling of Emma. So what is it about Emma that resonated so much with you? So I think um, I love how much of a comedy Emma is. Um, especially whenever I've watched like any uh, adaptations like movies or any of the like short series or anything like it's always just so funny and kind of ridiculous. So I think that really stood out to me. Um, I love her other works as well, like Pride and Prejudice um, and Persuasion and everything, but I think they can be a bit more serious. And with the other books that I've written, so with my like fantasy romance duology, it was definitely very like intense with like politics and like betrayals and things like that um and then when a brown girl flees it's like about you know a teenage girl running away from home and kind of grappling with all of these like spiritual and family and mental health issues so all very like serious intense stuff um so when I was writing um this romance novel I kind of really wanted it to just be really fun and really funny and kind of really lighthearted and silly um so Emma was just perfect for that Wonderful. And it really is the perfect summer read. I think I read it in two sittings, uh, going to a vacation and then coming like sitting oh, in the vacation. <laughs> and it was just perfect because like the stakes are stakes, but it's just lovely. And there's just so much heart in this novel. So you should be so proud of it. Thank you. <laughs> and with retellings, especially of quite popular works, there are a lot of plot beats and character arcs that the audience is going to expect to see. But the beauty of a retelling is that you get to put your own twist on it. You're kind of spice in the recipe. So what Amna stamp are you most proud of? Yeah, so I think when I was actually thinking about this, because um, somebody else had asked me this too, like how, did, how was it making the retelling your own, you know? Um, and I'm honestly just like so proud and like happy with how all of it came together um and I think retellings are really fun in that aspect where you get to be so creative where it's kind of like you have these plot points that you need to include in your story but then you can kind of play with them and twist them around and it's really interesting to see how you can take those same things and then change them um so one plot point that I had a lot of fun with was in the original Emma story obviously there's like this big ball um, but obviously in the modern day, we don't really have balls anymore. Um, so then for that, I included kind of like a big wedding scene um, that Homera and all the characters go to. And I think that's also very fitting because like as Bakhsani, I feel like I'm going to weddings like literally every weekend in the summer. There's just always weddings going on. Um, so that's kind of similar to how, you know, back in Regency England, there'd be balls going on all the time. Um, so that was really fun to include into my own thing. And then another scene that I had fun with was um, the when they're going to the picnic. I think in the original text, it's not there's not as much going on in the lead up. Um, the focus is more on like that big picnic scene, and it's kind of the big climax when um, Emma is you know un 
unintentionally cruel to Mrs. Bates. Um, but in my story, I really, uh, well, I didn't have Mrs. Bates, but um, there was a similar climax point going on there because I wanted to stay true to the original story. But leading up to the picnic scene, there's this, you know, scene of Homer and Fog just like walking together through the park. And I thought that was really lovely. And I really enjoyed kind of focusing on those little moments and then drawing them out um, where maybe in the original text, you didn't get as much out of those little moments. Very true. Yeah. And I, I love all those little in between pieces that you had, like there's a scene where she's sick in bed. There's a scene where she's yeah. scared of a scary movie. Like there's all these little pieces where you really uh, brought depth to Humera where it could run the risk of, oh, this is just like a watered down version of the Emma that everyone knows and loves and the audience can fill in the blanks. No, you really gave her so much complexity. I think she's she's an engineer as well, or she- Yes, she is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so she's got all these layers. Yeah. She makes incredible pastries. <laughs> and I also really loved, uh, not that one is better or worse, because we're not going to do that here, but- <laughs> I really love the twist you put on that Mrs. Bates, Miss Bates scene, because that one is so key to Emma. And it really is like the turning point of her character arc. And I really love the switch in character that you directed her comment to, because I think it almost hit harder because it was, it's like, it's harder to betray a friend than a acquaintance, right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So that was really well done. I'm like trying to be very careful, not giving it away <laughs> yeah. so that the reader can enjoy it. But yeah, I loved when you read that part, you're going to love it too. It's so Thanks. good. <laughs> Austin's works are quite timeless because first and foremost, she wrote about people and people never really change. That said, the Regency era was a very different time. Was there anything that required significant reworking to fit into our modern era? You already mentioned the balls, but was there anything else that needed reworking? So I feel like it actually wasn't too difficult um, just because I was writing about like a Pakistani American and like Muslim community. I feel like even to this day, there's so many similarities within those communities with like Regency England. Um, so actually adapting it you know, even though it's been like 150, 200 years since that time period, um, a lot of those kind of ideals of like courtship and just like um, community and like family values and stuff like that um, still like hold really true in Pakistani American and Muslim communities. And I feel like that's a big reason of why I am so drawn to like Jane Austen's work and like why I feel like I can relate to a lot of some of the stuff that the characters are going through. Um, because it is so similar to like a lot of like the rules that kind of still exist um, in like my own communities. Um, so it, it wasn't too difficult to translate that to like a modern audience. But even so, like, I feel like with these, and I'm trying not to spoil it either, but it's like a retelling. So obviously you kind of know how yes. at the end, <laughs> they end up happily ever after. But in, you know, all these like Regency stories and everything, it always ends with like, a marriage and like a proposal which I feel like in today's age it doesn't usually it's like you know people like date for a few years and then like even courtships like last so long um so I feel like that was one thing that I had to play with a little bit with how I wanted to include it in my own story um because obviously any Emma retelling or adaptation or not retelling but any adaptation you see it always ends with like a big wedding scene um but I think it's a big leap in the modern era to just go immediately to marriage mm -hmm. usually like even if you're getting engaged people are like okay like let's be engaged for a little bit like get to know each other more and stuff like that so that was like one thing that I had to play with a little nice yeah and you did it very well because there were still talks of marriage so it did feel realistic and that the love was going to end up there but it is, it's very much like if you're planning out a novel that's taking place over a few months or even a year or so, that is a huge jump <laughs> for our modern <laughs> era. So it almost would have felt like, oh, okay, I guess. Yeah. So I, I like the twist that you had. And also you made it very realistic in like what life looks like for people these days. And you can't just be like, now we're married and everything is happy and we're going to live together because yeah. we've got families and we've got friends and we can't just drop everything for yeah. 
love as much as we say we would. So <laughs> I think you did a really good job bringing it into the modern age. Um, yeah, no, I loved it. Thanks. And <laughs> who is your favorite character to write and why? Ooh, okay. I love all the characters and I, but I feel like Homera was my favorite character to write um, just because she's kind of so ridiculous. So it was really, really fun just like being in her head and writing her voice and kind of allowing myself to be, or like allowing her to be very like obnoxious and, you know, a bit unlikable at times. Um, I think Jane Austen even says that Emma is like such an unlikable character that only Jane Austen will like her. But, you know, every time I read Emma or see an adaptation or anything, like I always love Emma. I think that she is very lovable, even though she obviously has these very obvious flaws. Um, so yeah, so I just loved writing Homer and, you know, playing with all the little, those depths of her and those different aspects of her character and just like allowing her to be herself, um, even if that is at some point, at some points unlikable and she's not making the best decisions. Um, because I think, you know, obviously in real life, that's how people are. Even if I think about all like the people that I'm close with, like my close friends or close family members, things like that. Like there are obvious points where sometimes they're doing things and I like, I'm like, what are you doing? You know? So I, I had that same sense with Homera, but in a very like loving way. So that was really fun to write. Yeah. And I think actually one of my favorite adaptation, like film adaptations of Emma is Clueless. Yes. Because I think they really translated the very privileged, very bright, but very naive yeah. rich girl that Emma is, where some adaptations tend to make her a little more malicious or a little more yeah. snobby. And I love the kindness that Clueless exactly. gave to Emma. Yeah. And I think you did a really good job with Humera yeah. as well, because you were you were gentle with her because she is young and growing and um her life has led her to be a certain way, but she could be a lot worse. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Emma always, and you're so right about the Clueless adaptation because she's never meant to just be like a snobby, like mean girl. Mm -hmm. Like she can come off that way, but it's just because of like the way she's raised or her environment or, you know, also like she lost her mother at such a young age and everything. So it's, she's not doing it on purpose. And then of course, when, you know, things are pointed out to her or she does realize her mistakes, she does her absolute best effort to, you know, do better versus like a mean girl is kind of just mean for the sake of being mean, um, which I don't think Emma or Homer or any Emma adaptation is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, cause in uh, Austin, there's a thing where the male lead usually gets shown his flaw and then goes away works on it himself comes yeah. back a better person but I think Emma's one of the few and I'll have to you know think about this <laughs> deeper than on the spot right now but where she gets that feedback yeah. and she goes away she reflects and she becomes yeah. a better person which is very beautiful to see because yeah. you know we're, we are like you say just trying our best and yeah, yeah. definitely and so because we've got these archetypes. When you think of a retelling, you've got all the little characters that you can pull from and use, but you also want to put your own spark into them. What advice would you give aspiring authors who want to write a retelling and they want to give their characters the same level of depth you've given yours? Oh, okay. That's good. Um, I think just a really important step is to pick a source material that like you really, really love. Um, I feel like because like I love Emma so much I've you know read the book and seen so many adaptations like so many times that I just felt really really familiar with all the characters um, so then when I was adapting them I feel like I knew kind of like the essence of the characters so then it wasn't too difficult to imagine how they would react in you know situations in my book that weren't there in the original um, so I would definitely say as advice to choose a source of material that you just really enjoy and really love um, because I think if you're choosing something random you won't be able to translate it as well just because you won't know the characters as well um, and then another piece of advice I would say is anytime I'm writing anything I feel like I use people from real life as kind of reference points not that like you know this side character is exactly like you know this friend of mine but like little quirks or like little personality traits, I always love pulling from like 
people in real life, even if it's, you know, maybe just like a conversation I've had with someone or like a moment that we've experienced together. Um, so I always love kind of including those in my stories and in my characters. And I feel like it really adds that authenticity and the depth and everything. So that would be another piece of advice to, and that's a piece of advice for writing in general, I would say, to look at real people and interact with real people and kind of pull from real life because, you know, obviously on the page, it is two dimensional, but if you're pulling from, you know, real things and real emotions and real experiences, then you can add that depth to your characters. Oh, definitely. And also too, especially because you wrote it in first person narrative, sometimes it's easy to have everything fall into place around them if you're just really focused from that one perspective. But if you have in mind exactly like the values of these side characters, then they can react in a way that doesn't serve the main character or they can yeah, exactly. interpret something in a way that is maybe not correct, but yeah. is going to affect how those characters interact. So it's less of a everything is fine and nothing hurts for this one yeah, character. Definitely. Like in If I Loved You Less, there is a lot of that with um, Humera where she doesn't really understand why Fouad is so grumpy whenever she brings up Rizwan. But I think it's kind of clear for like the readers that like, obviously he's just like really jealous. Um, but like she, cause it's like in first person, she can't see or understand that. But, you know, it's kind of evident that that is what he's experiencing. Yes, and then it's lovely too because you get this internal monologue, even with how she interacts with her friend who's like the Harriet character. Sorry, I can't remember her name. Gonza, yes. Yes. Um, then she was like, oh, I'm such a good friend. I love how yeah. she <laughs> is so into this guy and da 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 da. Meanwhile, this poor girl is like in love with someone else. Someone and else, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like, Mara obviously doesn't realize because she's just enclosed in her own myopic point of view. Mm -hmm. Um. So then that that was also I, it was nice to write her being like very like myopic and kind of closed and then like slowly like her perspective opens and she's like oh like there's a lot going on that I didn't even know about yes yes yeah. <laughs> and man am I clueless yeah <laughs> uh will you be releasing Humaira's recipes anywhere for the readers that you've left with growling stomachs because that was one of my favorite <laughs> things is she has so many scenes where she's baking the most delicious baked goods treats pastries, <laughs> and everything. um I definitely could I feel like a lot of her recipes are definitely recipes that I've made um and they're like things that I like like cream puffs or like lemon bars stuff like that um I haven't compiled all of them together though um but in the back there is I think one or two recipes not from Homero there's one I think a brownie recipe from her sister because there's like a scene where she's saying that she like loves her sister's like brownies um and yeah. then there's the grilled cheese and tomato soup recipe in the back which is a scene where Fouad makes that for her when she's sick because that's like her favorite comfort food amazing yeah best comfort food grilled cheese tomato soup so it's literally <laughs> my comfort food <laughs> yeah exactly sad day grilled cheese tomato soup <laughs> <laughs> And what is something you included in your novel that you really geek out about? Ooh, so I feel like there were a lot of fun little references. So I did a little reference to Clueless right in the beginning where I think a guy is trying to maybe approach her or something and she does like the uh, as if thing, which is so funny from the movie. Um, and then there's another line where she's talking about kind of how handsome Fouad is um but then she says but not handsome handsome enough to tempt me which is like a Pride and Prejudice reference even though it's an Emma retelling yeah. just because I think that line is like so funny because obviously Darcy says it and then later he obviously does fall in love with Lizzie and then Homera says it and then later she does fall in love with Fouad so those are fun. <laughs> and that's so fun that you pulled those as your favorite moments because they were some of my favorite moments. I just remember <laughs> reading and being like, ah! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it always feels like a little inside joke that I'm having with like any reader that's going to understand that. Yeah. And it, it really is a love letter to Austin in general. And then having those little moments is just a really good like you know, when you find someone who has a similar interest to you and yes. you're like, oh my gosh, we're the same. Yeah. It's like they understand uh, the tiny references. <laughs> exactly. Could you share a favorite quote or passage with us? Ooh, okay. So there was this one line that I really liked um, where Homera says, um, maybe we only make rules to see who we're willing to break them for, um, which 
I think it's so like emblematic of like how you do act when you're in love. Um, and especially for someone like Mara, she lives a very kind of orderly life where like she's very particular about like how she dresses, like her home, like every she's like very particular about everything. Everything has to be in order. Um, and she kind of like has these rules that she follows. Um, and she like, you know, follows like societal rules and all of this stuff. But then when she does fall in love, it kind of does make her like out of control and it kind of freaks her out. And it's like this whole new experience for her. Um, so I just really liked that line because I feel like I'm similar in a way where I also like things to be orderly. But then when things do happen, like when you do fall in love, you do realize that like, you know, all of that order, all of those rules that you had for your life, or, you know, all of those maybe like requirements or things that you thought were important, kind of none of that really matters. All that matters is, you know, the love that you're experiencing. It's so true. Yeah, every girl's got a checklist of all the things she yeah. expects her future man to have. And then she meets the man. And it's like, oh, yeah. The, any of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. And it is it is a really pure and true like coming together of two souls love story, which I really loved about it. I think there's, uh, and no shade, because uh, there's a reason why they're popular, but there is a focus on like the lust love stories yeah. at the moment. And I really loved the kind of timelessness and beauty that was the unfolding of Humara and Fawad's uh, yeah. union. It was just really beautiful to watch. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful summer read as I said because it's just <laughs> lucky and wonderful yeah <laughs> thank you and what are your upcoming projects yes so I've been currently working on both of them actually this month I have a book coming out in January which is an adult cozy romanticy and it's titled the baby dragon cafe it's about this cafe owner who trains a baby dragon and then falls in love with the dragon's owner and it's like set in like a small town. It's very like cozy. Um, and then in March, I have another book coming out. That's a YA cozy fantasy romance. And that's titled A Witch's Guide to Love and Poison. And it's about a garden witch who, when her sisters get um, poisoned, she has to team up with her rival to try and find a cure. And then they fall in love along the way. I love that. Oh, two more cozy reads. Perfect. And they'll be ready for next summer for me. I'll put yeah. it on my t uh, TBD. Wait, yeah. TBR. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. My to be read list for sure. <laughs> and where can we find you online? Yeah. So I'm pretty active on Instagram. My handle is Amna underscore Qureshi. Um, and my Twitter is also pretty active. My handle is Amna Kureshi underscore. And then I'm always, you know, my website is always updated. So it's just Amna Um, Yeah, those are the main places that you can find me. <laughs> Wonderful. So what I will do, I will put all those links in the description and this will be going in my newsletter. So in there too. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Thank you so much for having me. I had so much fun chatting. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone who's listening for joining in on our chat. If you liked what you heard, please take a minute to rate and follow this podcast or share with a like-minded friend. I release new interviews every month with no set date. So if you are subscribed or a follower on Spotify or YouTube, then you won't miss anything. Wherever you are, however you ended up here, I hope you're living magically. Mm -hmm.